objective work while I'm giving it. There we go. The idea of this talk is um, basically to you know throw out some ideas around the concept of crowdsourcing and domain programs so that yeah, yeah. they've really uh, this whole idea has you know, been adopted quite rapidly over the past two years or so. And um, you know, I think there's certain sets of thinking around the whole idea that are good, um, but one of the things that I wanted to throw out today to get you guys thinking about is you know, some of the ways that basically creating a better security feedback loop between external researchers and your engineering teams and business people uh, can really improve you know, the defensive mindset that exists within the organization. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Casey, as I mentioned, uh, just another one Aussie hacker. Um, that's a Julian Assange joke, which most people don't get, but that's okay. Um, so, recovering pen tester, uh, I, I basically cut my teeth doing, uh, you know, the network engineering and, and the pen testing side of things. Made a bit of a weird shift into solutions architecture and sales, uh, probably about eight or nine years ago, and then uh, you know, got bitten by the, uh, the startup bug and launched this thing called Bug Crowd, which um, has taken a life of its own over the past two years or so, which is a good thing. Um, as you can hear, I'm not from around these parts, uh, originally from Sydney, Australia, uh, moved to San Francisco at the beginning of last year uh, as, uh, as Bug Crowd got funded and so on. So yeah, I, I mean, I kind of you know, preempted this preamble a little bit, but I um, want to change the way you guys think or add something new to the mix of how you're thinking about connecting researchers with, with your organizations. Um, some of the problems that I'm going to address, you know, you guys might have figured some of these things out, um, but I'm speaking generally in terms of the difficulties that we face as, uh, as security professionals with, with figuring out how to get the business to really be, you know, mindful of the fact that the boogeyman is real, you know, this whole security thing is not just us doing the chicken little thing, you know, waving our hands around, it's actually a real thing that they need to be um, concerned about. And just for context, um, you know, I, I can code. I definitely don't consider myself a, a developer in, in the pure sense of the word. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this um, and approaching this from the angle of someone who's a breaker, for example. So, build a better hacker. Um, basically, by crowd, what we do and what we are, we're a platform uh, that basically connects security researchers with companies that need security testing, security work done. That could be in the format of a you know, traditional bug bounty program, like a Facebook or a Google program. Um, but what we also do is basically allow organizations to call it, like create an elastic security team out of the folks that we've got on the platform, right? As a part of that, there's 14 and a half thousand uh, people on the platform right now um, with pretty good activation. The people that are actually participating is quite high within that number. But one of the things that we decided that we wanted to do really early on is figure out how to get anyone who comes onto the platform. There's folks that are very skilled when they start, and then there's people that aren't as skilled, but they're enthusiastic, they want to actually get them to, to being a part of the security community. Like, how do we get them smart? How do we give them access to the things that they need to know, the tools that they need to have, what they need to learn to get them better and, and more useful to us and to our clients, but then also for them with whatever they want to do you know, outside of the whole bug bounty thing, get a job or whatever else. So, um, we've got like a really strong culture within the company of trying to educate and, and bring people up. And really, as I mentioned, you know, one of the things that, that we noticed is like through the course of really focusing on that, we started to see things happening, you know, call out the red team, we started to see things happening on the blue team side as a, uh, as a result of that interaction, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so who here is a, is a builder? <coughs> this is kind of a weird question, but whatever. Yeah, cool. All right. Who here is a breaker? Right? <laughs> Who does both? I feel sorry for you. <laughs> but I know, I know what that's all about. Um, the thing, like, in terms of the, the security, you know, challenges that we have, like, there's a fundamental difference between people that are incentivized and motivated to break things and, and tell people how things can be broken. Um, when you compare it and contrast it with the engineers that are actually building product, right? We're, we're different. There's, there's a, you know, almost a competitive tension between our two roles. And I think that's a cause of a lot of frustration for people in security. It's like, why don't, you know, why, why don't they get it? Like, uh, um, but that's how it is. And the reason, uh, you know, the fact that it's like that is, is actually something that makes, you know, the relationship valuable. And we don't actually want to change that. Uh, which is a little bit out of line with, you know, all of the talks that you hear that touch on this particular subject. I mean, a lot of it's about, okay, how can we get along? How can we, you know, da da da, -da. 
da-da-da-da-da-da. But it, like, we need to be intentional with each other. Um, because we are doing like literally the opposite thing. Um, you know, you've got the, the builders doing their thing, you've got the breakers doing their thing, um, and you know, the nature of the relationship is is set up in that way that it's always going to be there's always going to be a level of tension in there, and that's a good thing. Um, it's the question of how do you actually make that productive for everyone involved that, that we're trying to talk about here. So let's establish some of the, uh, the problem statements around that. Now, if you're a developer, if you're cutting code, and this applies to the business, uh, broadly speaking as well, really what your motivation is, is you're incentivized to push this feature by this state because, because reason. There's something that needs to be done. Um, and really, what you're there to do is to make the code do what it's meant to do as, as defined by the business and what the business thinks is valuable, right? The security people, it's like, well, okay, let's make sure they don't do anything to let the bag, let's the bag goes in. Um, you know, the challenge with this is that people that are in security, it's a great quote uh, from, from a mentor of mine, a good friend, Nick Ellsmore, um, who kind of threw it out as a side note in a conference one time. This whole idea that people that think like bad guys greatly overestimate the ability for everyone else to think like that. You know, for us, it's like the idea of, of you know, wanting to get behind the locked door and understanding the steps that are involved in doing that. It is something that comes naturally because that's how we're wired up. Uh, but the majority of people don't actually think like that. Um, and this doesn't make us better. Like it's it's not a superiority inferior, inferiority you know whatever thing. It just makes makes us valuable um, because they aren't thinking like that, right? And you know a tip around this is that you know the next time you feel like calling a developer dumb for for security decisions that they've made. Go build and, and launch a product first, and, and see how hard it is. Because ultimately, you know, they're just doing their job. We're just trying to do ours, right? You know, the second problem with the developers is security is a blocker. It, it's something that slows them down. Again, if their whole motivation is to get something out to market, they've got their boss writing, they've got the business writing, and whatever it might be, um, they need to go and get this done. Security is still at a point where we haven't really figured out how to insert these types of things into the development process in a way that's just completely frictionless and doesn't slow them down at all. So ultimately, if, it, if it's a decision between doing it securely or getting it done in a way that makes it work and satisfies the requirements of the job, this is the one that's going to win at the end of the day because that's, that's what they do, right? Um, which leads us to the problem of you know, the security person who's tearing their hair out saying, well, why aren't these people listening to me? Like, this is, you know, for us it's clear as day, um, you know, the things that we see, like the cultural things that go into bad security decisions that end up, you know, causing problems and so on, like, they're very obvious to us, but for some reason they're not obvious to them. Why is that? Well, you know, development, as I said, they've, they've got a job to do. And ultimately, their job, you know, in most companies, it's, it's like a 10 to 1 ratio, uh, if that, between um, engineering people and people that are dedicated in security, or even people that have like an understanding of security. And it's because it can exist without security folks to make sure it doesn't get owned. I mean, they're taking a risk in doing that, but ultimately, you can build a product that works, um, maybe nothing will happen. And that's a business decision that some people make. Development contributes to products which make money. If there's no development, there's no product, which means there's no money, which means there's no jobs for, for any of us. So, yeah, it's understandable that this is the way it is. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, security minimizes the risk of loss, but maybe nothing will happen. Maybe we can just push it and, and see how we go. And we see that all the time, right? Um, I think really what it comes down to is that they don't believe in the movement. Uh, they, they don't actually, you know, we, we, we sit here and we tell them about the risks, we tell them about, and, and I think, you know, 2014 was actually a pretty good year for, for getting people to believe in the boogeyman, just the profile of the breaches and then the number of consumers that were affected by that, so there's things that are happening that are trending in the right direction, but ultimately, you know, if security is just a set of blockers and not this nascent awareness of the fact that there is actually a real threat, um, then you know the prioritization of just getting features out as opposed to making sure they're secure while you do that is, is going to be uh, what happens, right? 
And the thing with security people is that we're really not all that great at, at educating them, to be honest. Like, a lot of the time we don't have, you know, we're, we're busy, we've got different things to do, we've got BAU and all, all these other things that we have to keep on top of. Um, you know, we don't have the people skills necessarily because, again, we're approaching it from the angle of a breaker, whereas they're looking at it from the angle of a builder. Um, we can't convince them, or we try, and sometimes we're successful, but a lot of the time it's just, it's, uh, it's difficult to do, right? And, and thanks for every security vendor ever for making this problem harder. Um, yeah, five works. I think, you know, if the starting point is getting someone off their seat and actually caring about this whole thing, then scaring them into action is a valid strategy, but fuck fatigue is a real thing. You know, you, you hit people with a stick enough times, they'll just get used to it and keep on going with what they're doing. Oops. Okay, that slide a little bit. So, you know, here's some of the things that we've got. We've got <coughs> checklists, we've got, you know, check-in testing, we've got CI, we've got all these different things, we've got training. Um, you know, we, we bring in people from the outside world, we even hire them into the organization to, to provide, call it a stopgap or a, you know, a backstop rather, uh, around, you know, things that are going on, making sure that if there is mistakes made, people are told. Um, but ultimately, you know, pretty much all of these things they get in the way, as I said before. It's like none of none of this stuff that we've we've developed is at a point where a developer can say, yeah, that's a frictionless process that allows me to get on with my actual job, and the security thing just happens as a function of that. So here's what we do. <laughs> and it's kind of fun, right? Like if you're a pen tester, if you're a security person, you know, oftentimes kicking people down the stairs and saying, hey, listen, you screwed up. Uh, it's my job to rock up and say hi and let you know that. <laughs> I love this because like, just in case you weren't sure this was Australian the EMU at the end there, it's like, pretty <laughs> 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 It is what it is. Again, fuck for it doesn't work over the long term. If you're sitting there in the same office as the people that are cutting the code and, and you're doing the, the kangaroo kicking the dude with the pond thing, um, ultimately that starts to be less effective over time. Um, because they get used to the sound of your voice, they get used to your message. And, and I think one of the other things that happens is that there's a bias that's placed on um, the people that are within the organization because you know, you know a lot more about what's actually going on than the average attacker does. So the question is, how do we get the business to believe in the boogeyman? Because ultimately it's about where does the driver sit? Is this an internalized thing for the people that are cutting your code? Or is it an external driver? Um, and really, if you know, the same thing, if you can get it to, to the point where it's like a nascent awareness that just exists within your organization and you're way ahead. I think a better question is how do we create better security feedback for, for the business? Because ultimately, we can't teach them everything from, from the get-go. So there is a level of kind of iterative learning that, that comes through you know, us being able to provide feedback into what they're doing and steer. Uh, steer how they're doing their thing, right? So the thought here is, you know, one of the uh, management tips that I, that I use a little bit in the office, uh, I try to, you know, not do it too often, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, the best way to get something the attention it deserves is to set it on fire, right? Yeah, sometimes you have to let things fail uh, in order for people to, to realize the fact that, okay, this is something that we actually need to do, and this is not a big I quote, but I could totally pitch it in saying it. <laughs> um, yeah, the McAfee version of this is uh, the most security aware a company's ever going to be is, is just after it's been breached, right? And, and John McAfee didn't actually say that, but it, you know, the fact that it's true is why he's riding a stogie with a, with a Benjamin in, in this picture, right? It, it's been a very successful strategy for security vendors all around the place to capitalize on bad things that happen because all of a sudden the booking man's real for, for that particular customer and, and for the rest of the market as well. Now, some good examples of this, um, Heartland. Heartland got completely owned and um, basically they partnered up with a company called Voltage to go and implement annual in encryption for their payment systems. Um, and then, probably 12 months later, came out and, and basically positioned themselves as the thought leader in that space, uh, which you know, was kind of annoying but also awesome at the same time. Like they used 
the breach to affect a change in the mindset within the organization and then double down on it to turn it into a marketing problem, which is pretty crazy. Um, you know, target with, with their new CISO. Uh, you know, obviously, we all know what happened there. Um, you know, CEO uh, goes out the door and, and they basically implement a new team to get stuff done. Same thing, they had a bad experience. All of a sudden, this whole security thing goes from being this you know, nascent kind of ephemeral threat that the security people talk about from time to time but we don't actually believe in to, oh wow, this is actually real. Um, JP Morgan Chase, uh, you know, they announced a, a huge increase to their budget in response to a security breach, right? Etc. 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 Like you guys have seen this happen probably in your own organizations and there's plenty of other examples. So that's nice. Um, but how do we avoid the whole, you know, being in the paper part? Because that, that kind of sucks, right? Um, how do we create this security feedback loop where there is this, like, real uh, awareness of the fact that the man's real and we have to do things to prevent bad stuff from happening? And obviously that's a biased uh, suggestion, but bug bounties. Ali Brosh. The legend. You know, if you guys don't know what a bug bounty program is, um, basically the, the way it works is you go out and put an offer, uh, you know, you set up a scope, you set up an offer to, to the security community um, or a subset um, and basically say if you guys can find, guys and girls, if you can find issues within our programs and you're the first to find a report a unique issue that's within the scope of what we're doing, will reward you for it. So you incentivize that, you know, that testing, you incentivize that feedback loop. Um, it's been a pretty interesting ride for the whole bug bounty thing. So bug crowd started, you know, initially the, the idea was first had probably midway through 2012 um, and we kicked things off in 2013. Um, and, and really, you know, that's that's been kind of our, our trajectory with all of this. But the first bug bounty program was in 1995. Uh, it was actually Netscape who, who did it. Um, a bunch of others started to jump on board. Uh, there was the, uh, you know, the ZDI program and some of the broker things came out. But really, when it started to properly take off was, was around 2010, when some of the big social media companies started getting involved. And we've been quite loud about it. Like, they, they were obviously engaging with this process um, and getting the benefit from that. But they doubled down and, uh, you know, got the marketing benefit out of it as well. Because it's still at the point where it's novel enough in the industry to be quite a badass thing so that you're doing as a company. Um, and you know, last year in particular, I mean ourselves, there's there's other companies that have joined the space, so HackerOne and Crack Hurry and others. And um, you know, hat tip to Katie who's here in the crowd as well. I think that the Microsoft uh, bug bounty program when that got launched, that was a real tipping point in, in the market's perception of this whole idea as you know maybe this isn't just something that you know crazy Bay Area startups and, and you know social media companies do. This might actually be a better way of solving this issue of finding out where we're vulnerable, creating that feedback loop and figuring it all out before the bad guys do. So and there's a lot of folks doing it, so you know that's that's the other piece there. Um, the thing is, and this goes back to really the thrust of the talk, it's not just about being cheap, like they are cost effective, you're connecting, uh, you know, there's obviously the cost of actually running the program, but in terms of the pay that's going out, it's connected to directly with the result that you want, so yes, they're cost effective. It's not just about being loud, like as I said before, it is still a pretty badass thing to do and there's a level of just something that you can engage in if you're going to do it publicly, which is good. Um, that's not the main point. The whole bug bounty thing, like the way we look at it, it's about leveling the playing field. Um, you know, if, you, if you're being attacked by a crowd um, that's, that's incentivized based on the results that they're able to receive, then it makes sense to respond in kind with what you're using to defend yourself, right? Um, but to the point of this talk, it's also about introducing your developers to the fact that there are people out there that can hack your stuff, right? So this is Igor Homokov. Um, and, uh, it's funny, I put this deck up on SlideShare and you notice this picture in there, you got pretty excited about it. It's like one of the more badass shots of him kicking around on the net. Like, he's, he's, I think, 18 or 19 years old. Very, very clever, right? Um, the thing with Igor is he's also known as the guy who totally owned GitHub at that time. So basically, he found an O-date in Rails, reported it to GitHub. Um, they didn't 
believe him. Um, so what he ended up doing was pushing uh, into their master branch to, to prove his point, and at that point they realised he was he was on something. Yeah, you know, GitHub as a company, <laughs> you know, as a company um, yeah, they've always been quite progressive when it comes to security, but really when you look at the timeline of when that all took place and, and then how they doubled down on internal security, but also how they were evangelizing their posture when it comes to security, because obviously they've got a lot of stuff to protect, right? It's important for them. Um, that was really a, you know, a, a pretty strong catalyzing event for that. Um, the thing with Igor is that, you know, the way we kind of refer to these people around the office, he's, he's a good guy who thinks like a bad guy, right? He could be a very effective criminal. Um, he's, he's smart enough, he's resourceful, he understands how to get things done and all of that, but he doesn't want to do that. Like, there's a, there's a Dan, Kaminsky, uh, Dan Kaminsky quote that floats around, I think it's Dan, um, not everyone wants to be a drug dealer, right? Um, and this is the thing, like, these people have the capability to do bad things, but they don't want it. They, they, they want to exercise their skill, they actually want to engage it in a way that keeps them on the right side of you know, their ethical, like their own moral and ethical lines and so on. And the thing is we get the opportunity to engage them and, and bring them into the conversation. Um, the really interesting thing about uh, <coughs> these people and when they start engaging with, with organisations from the outside world is for a developer who's sitting there cutting code who's just had that code owned by some 18 year old kid uh, in Russia. Like, great, yeah, he's cool, thanks for helping us out and all of that. I wonder what his next door neighbor can do. Um, you know, I wonder if he is also a good guy who thinks like a bad guy or if he maybe has malicious intent. You know, it, it takes this whole idea of uh, the fact that this is possible from being this, as I said, ephemeral, like out there kind of risk that we talk about all the time but they don't really believe. So, okay, that just happened, that literally just happened. Uh, it's about better security feedback, right? So you're, you're bringing in people from the outside world with the weight that, that carries when they go into the engineering teams and say, hey, listen, I just own your stuff. Um, that loop is incredible. So really, this, this whole idea of bug bounties, disclosure programs, in general, just engaging the external research community, it's like getting hacked um, in, in the sense that, you know, it, it, it creates the same psychological impact for a developer as a real security incident, uh, but it's done in a way that's controlled and obviously doesn't end up on the front page of the New York Times, which is nice as well. So a couple of stories on, on how we've actually seen this play out with customers. And the thing with this is, yeah, I mentioned um, our focus was building a better hacker, and then we started to see this kind of trend in, in how companies were responding to having this feedback loop in place on, on, the, on the back end of things. You know, it wasn't something that we necessarily were deliberate about setting out to achieve in, in the first place. Um, but then we noticed it and then it became so consistent that it's something that we're actually really doubling down on in terms of making sure that the customers are getting that benefit as well, um, not just you know, finding out where they're vulnerable so they can fix it. Because um, the psychology of that thing, like you have someone from the internet that you've never met before, like they're not one of you guys who's sitting you know, at a table across from them who knows what's going on inside the house. This is someone who has no more knowledge than anyone else on the internet who's come in and own their stuff. The psychology of that for a developer is very powerful. Um, here's an example of, say, water up there. Cheers. There it is. Yeah, want some? Yeah, please. Get the large shot. Thank you. Um, so here's an example. So this is Mozilla's bug bounty program uh, when they kicked off. Um, this is part of one of Michael Coates' things. Um, so this is one of Michael Coates' um, slide decks that he, he put out a little while back. Um, but what it shows is the basically the trend of payouts uh, for the Mozilla program after they kicked off, right? And what you see at the start. This is like Mozilla clearing their assurance debt. Um, so at that point, they're getting more eyes on target. You, you're bringing in more uh, different skill sets. Obviously, the reward and the incentive model for the people that are looking is different. They're not there to spend time looking. They're there to actually achieve a result. Um, and this is pretty typical of, of what we see. Like there's this kind of backlog of things that were unknown unknowns beforehand. 
that are, that are getting cleared out by, by engaging you know, a broader community of people. So they got that out of the way, and then what you see here is it kind of you know, steadies out, which is good, um, but then it starts to tail off at the end. And, and what was happening there was this, that security feedback loop starting to kick in with the, uh, the developers that were involved in, in actually cutting this code, and because they were seeing how people that thought offensively were interacting with it, they started to change their behavior. Um, and it wasn't a list of checks and balances and different things that they had to hurdle to get stuff done. It just became something that they knew was a potential um, outcome if they, if they you know, made a bad decision in terms of security of their code. So, you know, great success, right? <laughs> and as I mentioned, like, we see this pattern like, literally every single time. So we, we run programs that um, are ongoing. We run programs sometimes for customers that are kind of like a pen test, so they'll start and stop. Um, the ones that run on an ongoing basis, like that same curve, like every single time, literally. It, it, there's this big bump at the front, it steadies out, and then it starts to dip down as they improve their internal processes. So, you know, another example, uh, we had a pretty interesting scenario where uh, someone that we we're talking to about potentially becoming a customer contacted us and said, hey, we've got this extortion email from, from somebody in, in Eastern Europe. Um, who has found an issue, they'd like you know, an amount of money, and if we don't pay them, then they're going to go post it on full disclosure, exploit the bug, do all these different things. Um, you guys know hackers, like maybe you can help us with, with resolving this situation, right? Um, basically what we did is we put together like a one-man bug bounty, uh, just invited this guy to, to the program. Didn't tell him he was the only one on there though, um, so he, he, thought that, uh, he thought that he was competing against all these other people and because at that point the customer's gone and been proactive and said here's the terms, here's what we're going to decide is okay, um, plus we've also invited a hundred of your friends maybe, who knows. Um, he knows that at that point if the bugs that he's found get reported to, uh, to the customer first, he loses the ability to um, claim the bounty, obviously, because it's the first to find who gets paid, and then that bug gets fixed, so this opportunity to actually exploit it goes away as well. Um, we got the first issue, like the issue that he was actually talking about, that came in about 15 minutes after we sent him that email, and he went on, we actually went on to find a bunch more stuff as well. He's like, oh, can I keep going? Sure. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty unorthodox uh, scenario, right? I'm not, I'm not advocating that this is the right way to do things, but... Yeah, it was a situation that, that this model was able to resolve, which was pretty cool. And the thing is, for that customer, yeah, they, you know, this was a scenario where, you know, it, it's financial services, right? So then they're not new to the concept of extortion and financial risk and, and different things like that. But for this particular thing, it's like, okay, great. There's a feedback loop that we can now start to integrate into our development practices and our processes that will clean up. Uh, you know, anything that's outstanding that we need to, to to stop this happening again, but also start to, you know, be in a position where we can feel comfortable that we're not going to create new issues that might be exploited in the future. Great success. Uh, another one, a social media organization. Um, this, is, this is actually a really interesting story. The InfoSec team, they basically launched the program because they were having a really hard time uh, getting buy-in from, from management and engineering, you know, they're, they're sitting in there trying to get stuff done or whatever, um, but they were having difficulty getting traction, which is kind of a lot of what I was talking about at the front end of the, uh, of the presentation here. And they looked at bug bounties and the idea of basically bringing in researchers from the outside world as a way to add to their social proof when they went up to management and, and, and say, you know, hey guys, we need to change these things, we need to add these people, or whatever it might be. Um, invoke Picard management mode, let's set it on fire and see what happens. That was kind of their strategy, which again, unorthodox and you know, not necessarily recommended. It's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, but for them, it was very effective. They, they received budget for three new team members and, and things kind of progressed on from there. So yeah, there's a win there. Great success. Fourth one is an e-commerce provider that we uh, that we did some work for. So they were a long time, like a long-term customer of um, a, a web scanning product that's that's pretty well known around the place. And they were clean, so they were getting all the all the green ticks and, and everything was cool. Um, and because of that, the culture within the organisation 
you know, it's, okay, great, it, it's definitely better than nothing. I'm not saying that that stuff's junk, because it's not. Um, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, a good thing to do. But because they got to the point where they were optimizing their security remediation, but also their development from, for what the scanner told them, as opposed to what the bad guys were actually, you know, trying to do to exploit them, they relaxed in their culture. They, they were saying, okay, we're good. You know, we've got the security thing dialed in, it's all good. Um, we launched the program with them and basically we had admin and admins uh, through a chain attack within within the first day of kickoff. And you know, that was, I mean, for starters, great. They found that bug and they were able to fix it, which is good. Um, but as I said, you know, they thought they were doing a really good job uh, because that was, you know, what they were being told. They, they had green ticks, they had, you know, good looking dashboard and everything was 100% and PCI compliant and whatever else. Um, it turns out they were still vulnerable. And what happened off the back of this, you know, obviously they, they fixed that issue, but then again, a big shift in the culture. It's like, oh, hang on, maybe we need to rethink how good we are at this whole security thing because that was some dude that we've never met before. Uh, he doesn't know anything about the inside of this organization. He was able to basically climb the chain and, and uh, get admin of admin, you know, within a day of kicking off. So, great success. In terms of integrating this into your organization, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of ways to do it, and I think you know, one of the key things, I'll, I'll go into a few kind of how-to bug bounty things, and, and PS, you can do this on your own, you can do this with us, you can do this with others. This is not a, uh, you know, this um, advice I'm trying to make it as agnostic as possible, because it is literally a, a concept that you have a lot of flexibility in how you deploy. Um, but you know, here's an idea, right? Um, gamify your, your SDLC. So, so basically, set it up in a way where you've got the pot that's available for the bug bounty researchers, like the hackers, um, and then whatever's left in that pot at the end goes towards a party for the developers or something like that. So you know, you, like making this feedback loop even tighter, like creating this um, very clear, like it's a quantified, uh, explanation to the dev team of, of what the impacts of their decisions are and actually tightening that loop up even further. Um, bug bounties get paid from it, whether the hackers don't get the dev team. Um, you know, one of the things that can happen with this, and I think this is something that we've seen a little bit over the past while, you know, there's organizations where uh, you know, a thousand people in the company and they've got a security team of 20 or 30, um, but the security team knows that there's people within the engineering team uh, that they're not, you know, security people, they're not like career or whatever, that, that's not the job they signed up for, but they've got the goal in mind. Like they know, they're fascinated by this stuff, they, you know, they're sitting up until 2 a.m. on IRC doing the things when they go home and stuff like that. Like, where are they? Find them. Like, actually create an internal contest and say, all right, let's, let's go hack each other and see what happens, right? Obviously, you have to control how you do that, and there's some planning that needs to go into it. But as a concept, generally, you know, this is all about creating a better security feedback loop between your developers and, and the people that can uh, tell them they're doing something wrong. So ready to start. Bug bounties are awesome, as I've hopefully convinced you guys at this point. But they're also kind of hard. Um, when you kick them off, this is what tends to happen. So you're going out to the internet and saying, hey, come help us, right? And there's people that can help, like, there's a lot of people that are helpful or they want to be helpful. Um, the level of value in the help that they try to provide you varies quite a bit. Um, they are quite noisy. Uh, and, you know, we've obviously done a bunch of things to, to reduce that, which is part of what we're going out and doing. But just in general, this is, this is one of the things that you need to be aware of before you kick it off. So plan ahead. like. Get buy-in from, from the stakeholders, get buy-in from the PR team, from the, the developers themselves, obviously from management, not just the security team. It's only the security team that is running a, a project to launch a crowdsourced security program, especially a public one, then it's, it's not going to go great um, because there are a lot of moving parts and, and people do need to be involved. Um, you know, one of the golden rules that, that, that we put out there is that if you touch the code, uh, you, you should really pay, pay the researcher. So if you get information that comes in and that information results in a change, uh, you know, 
that's something where they've added value to you. The other thing is that the you know the, the bug bounty community, the people that are contributing, it is like it's growing, it's growing very rapidly, but it is quite closely like tightly knit. Um, so if they feel like you're shafting them, that's that's not going to go well for you. Um, so you know, just just being you know. I think organizations that get into this, they need to want to pay the researcher. They, they need to actually have an understanding of the fact that this is valuable information. Uh, this is information that we would have paid, you know, thousand bucks a day or more uh, for one guy to come in and do a pen test over a period of time. Now we're getting the, the community, which is essentially working for free uh, until they get paid. Um, we actually need to be responsible in how we treat them, if that makes sense. Uh, the mistake that everyone seems to make when they're thinking about this is that they think it's going to be all about how they integrate the process of, of dealing with the new information about the vulnerabilities they've received into, into their development cycles and things like that. And that's definitely a, you know, an important thing, right? But the bigger piece is how are you going to manage the community? Uh, if you've got all these people that are looking to help you, you know, as I said before, there's going to be lots of them. Um, some of them are going to actually be useful to you and some of them maybe not so much. But at that point, you've had someone from the outside world come in and say, hey, I want to help you guys out for free. And really, if you've made an offer to them um, in terms of what you're going to do if they do that, you've got a responsibility of actually closing the loop on that conversation and making sure that they're happy walking away from it. And um, you know, people forget that. And it's, it's easy to do because there are a lot of folks that are jumping into this. Uh, I, I think you know this is probably the other goal in all. I didn't touch the code, pay the bug is, is numero uno, but this is pretty close to the top as well. Um, aligning the expectations between your company and your team and the researchers before they engage, like that's the goal state, right? If you can be super clear on, okay, if you do this, this, and this, and then we decide this, then you're gonna get paid that. Um, as long as that's all clear before they start doing anything, then everything will go well. Like where it gets murky, where it gets messy, is where you change the rules on the fly. Uh, you know, people have to, you know, oftentimes you see, well not oftentimes, but there's been instances where companies have had to actually reduce the amount, like the, the level of the rewards um, that they're offering out to the community because of whatever reasons they are. Usually it's probably budget related, but I'm speculating. Um, the thing is that if you've had researchers come in and start work with this particular expectation that you've set and then you go and change that, again, you can create an issue with the community. So that's a simple problem to fix. Just plan ahead, figure out what you're going to do, budget it out, do all these sorts of things and make sure that you're very clear in the expectations that they should have before they engage with you. So really to summarize what I'm trying to kind of get out here is Good things happen. Um, if you tighten the security feedback loop between your engineers and the business, and, and the people that those engineers think are external to the business, um, you know, good things happen. It, it turns into, as I said, something that is an annoying checklist or, or a set of hurdles that slow them down from actually doing their job, to this nascent awareness that's you know, ultimately the end, end game of all of this for us is to make our job easier and more effective, right? So this is a good way to basically add leverage to that process. Um, you know, the cost effective, et cetera, et cetera, but they do create this sense of a controlled incident. Like, I've just been hacked. Holy crap, I need to do something about that, right? But without the, uh, the mess and fuss of, of getting in the paper. So yeah, um, go start one or think about starting one. You know, go start one probably seems a little bit premature because I've just told you guys all this stuff about like not going out and just jumping into it. <laughs> If you're thinking about it, it's, it's a good, good train of thought to be on and, and, and continue on it. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on the blog that, that can probably help out with how you're thinking about it, and, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. So what I'll, I heard a lot about hand testing not working that way. Hot problem is a way to go. Could you connect with you a little more? What needs to happen? Then you dare kind of engage the world like this. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is, like, what needs to happen? Yeah, what's happening is, like, you saw the incident you had there where there was zero, you know, the report. Yeah. Uh, no problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what else do you recommend they would have, should have done 
maybe at that point. Prior to that? Yeah, prior yeah, to yeah, for sure. I think, I think one of the big things is, you know, there's a sense of, I mean, there's a, when you say bug bounty to a, to a security person, they think, oh, Facebook, or they think Google, or they think Microsoft, like there's this kind of established, um, what is a bug bounty, you get a particular answer, and that, that answer tends to be weighted towards, okay, this is a disclosure program that's got an incentive attached to it that's that's public, um, which is one way to do it. Uh, I, I think, you know, there's, what we've been doing and what we've seen uh, customers do for themselves as well is really narrow down the, the number of people that are involved, for example, making sure that, you know, if, you, if you're doing something to kick off, the thing, with, the thing with the public program is you don't really get to unring that bell. Yeah. Uh, like once you start, it's, it's pretty hard to shut these things off because at that point you've gone out, you know, oftentimes the press will pick it up and, and different things like that. And, and there's this expectation in the community that, okay, cool, these guys are, they're good with this now, let's go. Um, so, you know, obviously you want to plan ahead um, and, and, you know, walk before you run. I think one of the things that we talk about a lot with customers is this whole concept of like crawl, walk, run. Um, so you, you kick off and you say, all right, if this is going to be a more, let, let's assume, um, but test the fact that this is going to be a more effective way of finding issues that you've got and start there. And then, you know, walking is, okay, let's start to ramp it up. And if your end game is to actually launch a public program and do all of that, then you know, gradually turn up the needle on the thing until they're ready to go. And obviously, you know, as I said, like the thing that's really critical about that piece of the process is making sure that all the stakeholders are aligned with what's going on. Because you know, all of a sudden, you've got dev cycles, you've got you know sprint cadences and different things like that that now have to have um, room in them to accommodate for the fact that you're going to probably, maybe, potentially, get external information that's going to need to be acted on pretty rapidly. Um, and, you know, not all organizations are set up in a way that they're ready to just do that straight away. So, yeah. Yeah. How do you think our bug bounty program is going to affect uh, vulnerability disclosure in broader terms, in terms of, like, CV numbers, vulnerability databases? Will it be some form of competition? Will it be new forms that will be disclosed or not being disclosed to any possible? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, what we've definitely seen over the past two years is this growing, I think, vulnerability disclosure in general, like in, in kind of called the good old days, um, was more about the academic component and just wanting to get stuff fixed and that there was you know, the opportunity to go out and blog and whatever, then that's great as well. Um, you know, what we've seen is as this concept has kind of grown, there is this expectation that, that is growing that, oh, cool, well, I'll probably get paid. Um, and, and that changes the behavior, changes the conversation. Like one of the, one of the areas where it gets a bit sketchy um, sometimes is when you see researchers that are, uh, th that are doing their thing um, on companies that aren't necessarily being proactive about the fact that they want that kind of information, they're not like don't have a disclosure policy or anything like that. Um, and going and sending someone a you know an, an intro email saying, hey, I found a bug, you know, by the way, can I get paid? Um, which is skirting a pretty fine line uh, between being helpful and, and extortion at that point. So there's some interesting stuff that's happening just in terms of the dynamic that exists. I think that you know the, the relationship between researchers and companies um, has always been a pretty fluid one. Um, you know, there's every time that it's like, okay, this is the established way that we do stuff, things change. Um, so I just think this is another iteration of that. In terms of how it affects CVEs and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, most of what we've been talking about um, and kind of when you say bug bounty to someone, what they usually think is, is more um, incentivized disclosure programs on like hosted code as opposed to you know installable code which is usually where you see CVEs pop up. Um, sometimes it's not the case, but yeah. So it'll it'll be interesting to try. Yeah. I've got two questions. So my first one is that in traditional testing you have a a very tight leash on the provider who's doing the pen testing for you. Yep. Um, where you have less of a leash on a large community of, of bug hunters especially in geographical areas you can't control, yep. uh, who might be being monitored by nation states and things like that. 
Um, is that probably the, the biggest combat that you face when running programs like these? Is, um, is that expectation of maybe <clears throat> now your security test is very, very open as opposed to when it was uh, controlled by you before? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the, the, the biggest objection uh, I think we find with, with organizations, particularly as you start to move away from like your, your classic kind of tech companies that are known for doing this type of thing and kind of kicking it off, is um, you know, they're used to keeping all the hackers on the outside. Um, so this whole kind of idea of, okay, let's actually invite the good ones to help us and, and we'll you know, figure it out as we go to some extent, like that's how they're thinking about it. It's a pretty much a 180 in how they've been thinking about it, which is um, disruptive, right? Um, you know, the thing with that though is that it's not just like putting up a page and saying, hey, come do this, is, is not the only way to do this, like we, this is, what bug, how, how bug crowd answers that is that we, we allow customers to segment by geography and, and different things like that if that's a problem for them. And what we tend to say is like, don't do that. If you don't have to, don't do it because the more folks you get involved, the more skill sets that you have in the mix, um, the better result you're going to get. But if that's if the idea of doing that is a blocker for them, then okay, cool, let's, let's solve that problem and get on with it. My second question is that um, I know a lot of the hunters, and yeah. uh, even through programs like this, after they're done with the program and they submit a vulnerability, like a, where they get remote code execution, there's kind of an expectation that they get to um, disclose it publicly anyway after it's been patched and stuff like that. Is there ever any residual residual risk or damage to the brand from even after completing like an ethical disclosure? Um, so that's have you ever heard of that at all? Like people, people yeah, that's that's that. an interesting one. I, I think you know we we don't I, ideologically. I, I think the the concept of, of coordinated disclosure and making these things public after their result is ultimately better for everyone. Um, but that's another one of those radical concepts for for most people that are doing this type of thing. And one of the objections that comes up is. If we're going out and letting people talk about where we've been vulnerable, what other information is that, does that give an attacker um, to, to figure out where else we might be vulnerable, for example? Because uh, it's the kind of, you know, that kind of information you can get a lot out of it. You can figure out what the dev teams are good at, not good at, you know, some of the internal processes and where they might be falling out and things like that. There, there is, um, you can extrapolate. So, yeah, I mean, we haven't. We haven't seen that, I, I can't think of an example where we've seen that come into play, but to be honest, I don't know that we'd ever hear of one if, if it did happen, because that would mean that a company's got hacked and, you know, uh, if it was covered by disclosure laws or, or, or involved credit cards or something like that, maybe we'd find out, but yeah, the, the answer is I, I don't really know, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure that we, we can know. But again, it comes back to, okay, what's, what, what are you comfortable with? Like, we do, what we do with that is, you know, as I said, I think the whole idea of disclosure and this information being shared is a good thing, um, but not everyone's ready for that. So what we do for, for the testers that kind of work their way up to the top of the, the crowd is um, we'll let them participate in private programs where it's actually under non-disclosure. Uh, but for those guys, obviously we've gone in and we've vetted them, you know, we've been working with them for a long period of time so we know that they understand that that's how this works and it's, it's cool, like no one's going to go rogue or anything like that. So, yeah. None of it's one size fits all. I think that's kind of the, the takeaway for that. Is, is the point, well, I don't maybe know, don't know as much about the researchers, but is the point that they want to kind of build their resume and that's why they want to disclose? Well, there's value if you build your own personal brand yeah. and you're able to disclose these vulnerabilities, companies will approach you. Yeah. Right. I mean, the bug bounties, be frank, are small to begin with, right? Um, and that's why a lot of your customers are from the third world. They're young, and uh, so they can afford to live on those bug bounties. But if you're living in a, if you're living in Europe, in the United States, yep. it doesn't pay to. It doesn't pay to protect your company. Yeah, I think the overall liquidity in the market is not at the point where where someone in the West can subsist off it fully yet. But you're right, there are a lot of people that we know in, in places like India and the Philippines and, right. and so on that, that are basically subsisting and some of right. this type of model. Um, so uh, the reason why I asked the question is because, you know, um, the company that I work for, we've been dealing with some researchers and yeah. many of them are from Europe for, for our company. 
Um, and so we <coughs> credit them when we disclose and we publish. Yep. And um, but my question on so on bug bounty, what if so that what if you're paying the person, but you didn't necessarily disclose the details of it, but provided them with some kind of you know, letter yeah. of reference or some other form where they can yeah, absolutely. I mean, they can say that, hey, I found <coughs> four critical issues, you know, while I was involved with this bug bounty for this yep. you know, company X, and uh, they, you know, this is a, a letter from them or whatever, and it's part of my. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's one of the things that's been quite unique about um, how researchers have engaged with this with this model as it started to take off, because you know normally this kind of work's done under NDA, um, and like you might go and brag on something that you found over a beer at, at DEF CON with the N3 buddies or something like that, but there's, there's no kind of third party attestation to, to their skill over time. So I think, um, yeah, there's a couple of variations on that. Obviously going out and being able to write up a bug is, is a good thing uh, for them because they can go out and talk about how they were thinking about it, they can talk about what they found, they can talk about their skills and so on. Um, you know, downstream from that, there's, there's all these different things where, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to kind of cut the cookie here. Um, you know, for us, what we do is we have a, a ranking system where they're competing against each other uh, with points and so on. <coughs> when they're not able to actually talk about the issue specifically that they found, there is some degree of recognition that they can go and point to and say, hey, that's me on like number six or number 10 or whatever. And you know, an example of that, we, we um, one of the uh, fairly well known bug bounty people um, just got hired by a Tesla and he's a, he's a sysadmin, um, like he comes from that background, right? So he wasn't a career security person, um, but obviously very gifted uh, and good at thinking like a bad guy. Um, and really what, what the whole bug bounty thing was for him is that it gave him like a very low barrier to entry to actually enter into the security industry. Um, and Tesla didn't hire him because he was a bug crowd tester. Tesla hired him because he was awesome. Uh, but one of the reasons they knew that was because he could point to his page on our site and say, listen, <laughs> that's me. That's like, here's all these people, and this is where I sit in those ranks. So yeah, it, like the, the cash is, a, is an incentive. I think the, the social recognition, the ability to actually build uh, credibility in a resume, you know, I almost see that as the, um, the more active driver at the moment. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between pen testing and this approach and how effective that is for, let's say, a company that is looking to pen test an application yep. um, versus you know, trying to find the holes in the way that they coded an online application and kind of the difference between a native application and web applications, if there really are any differences in this model versus hiring a third party pen tester. A lot of clients that will need to get their security validated by doing the pen test with that native application. I'm just wondering if this type of a bug bounty approach would actually work for companies that are creating proprietary native applications that they want to pen test to yeah, yeah. see how durable it is yeah, and sure. how accurate. Um, so you know, there, there's things that there's things that the crowdsource model is is you know not going to be good for. Like you, you, you don't want to crowdsource a wireless assessment, for example. I think that'd get pretty awkward. Um, you know, and, and internal testing different things like that. So it, it's not a okay. Bug, bug bounties, crowdsourcing eats the traditional consulting model in, in its entirety. Um, but I will say that you know one of the reasons. That, this all got started. I, I ran a pen test firm in, in uh, Australia for a couple of years before kicking off Bug Crowd. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this was because I you know, had good guys in the team, you know, making sure they did good work and so on, but always feeling like they were disadvantaged um, economically when you compare to the resourcing that's available to the adversary. Right? It's like for them, it's lots of hackers, lots of different skill sets, lots of different motivations and the reward model, how they're approaching it, it's not based on the time they spend, it's based on what they get out of it. Um, so, you know, this kind of idea popped up and we started testing it and, and on average, like when we do 
application security tests that are actually we've got a case study that's coming out pretty soon and I'll, I'll speak to this as well. It's in the order of three to five times the number of vulnerabilities per, per dollar spent. And I know that's kind of a fuzzy metric because what's a vulnerability, but um, we're talking about like solid, unique individual issues that get found. And then because as well, the incentive model for the researchers is to actually come up with the best issues. So the you know kind of the way it works is the more creative or severe the issue you find, the more you get paid. So they're, in, they're incentivized to be first, but they're also incentivized to go deep. Um, you get more complex issues falling out of that as well. So uh, as to like installed code versus hosted code, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because we're, like, we're, we're doing both at the moment. And I think we're, we're seeing fairly consistently that, you know, 10 heads, is, 10 heads are better than one when it comes to this type of application. So yeah. yeah. I'm getting a wrap up, so thank you everyone. Thank you.